I'm going to talk a little bit about an R package that is called MapView. I'm not sure I'm going to spend the whole 45 minutes because I really don't know how to present a lecture about a tool that doesn't really have any underlying theory behind it. So, um, but Robin said he's fine with me finishing early because he's got tons of content that he wants to show you. So. <clears throat> Um, if you want to find me and get in contact with me, I'm on GitHub, Twitter, and you can write me an email, or if you have any specific map view issues or requests or whatever, feel free to open up um, bug reports or feature requests um, in the issues at uh, the GitHub link to map view that is provided there. Um, so what is MapView? MapView is basically a wrapper, if you so will, around an R package that is called Leaflet, which provides a <clears throat> access to a JavaScript um, library that by the same name, which is called Leaflet as well. Um, and that is intended to make web mapping easy, very easy. So that's leaflet on the JavaScript side. Then the app <coughs> package that provides access to it is already very uh, convenient, um, but it's, it takes a bit of coding, some, a few lines of codes to actually get a working uh, map. And I, or we, because that was in the beginning a very collaborative um, effort, wrote um, a little wrapper around it that now grew into a full-blown package. Um, to make it even easier to provide um, access to web mapping in R. Um, which brings me to the why and the scope of the um, package. In my view, MapView is intended to help people during their workflow. So quick and easy plotting or viewing of intermediate steps during their spatial analysis um, workflow. So it's not intended to provide presentation grade presentations of your data or maps of your final results that you then, I don't know, send to customers or present somewhere on the web. And when you get into the nitty gritty bits, MapView will have its issues uh, with customize, um, customizability. Uh, but there is Leaflet, and MapView integrates with Leaflet quite well, so you can extend it to your own wishes or own needs quite easily. I'll show you more of this tomorrow or the day after, depending on the schedule changes that we might face. Um, but why did we write MapView? I personally find myself very often plotting things in between just to look what happened in the last analysis step. Um, just because I'm a very visual person. And when you, for example, plot an SF object, which uh, Edsa just um, introduced you to, this one is called breweries. It's just a collection of locations of breweries in Franconia. We'll work with this data set tomorrow quite extensively. Um, this is what you get. So for each attribute column in your data table, you get one plot color-coded by the attribute distribution, basically, over the geometries. But that's it, which is nice. But it's um, when you have many more points, it doesn't really help you understand um, the <clears throat> um, distribution very much. Okay. So what MapView does is take a different approach. You plot the geometries only once and then provide the feature attributes that are behind each point via a pop-up that you can query for each of those points. So you, with your mouse, you click on the point, and you get all the information from your data table or data frame um, that is behind that point. You plot them on a map, so you get a map background just for orientation where you are on the planet, or in that case in Franconia or in Germany. Um, you get some features which are more GIS-like um, or which people are used to from GIS systems, 
like you get a little button down here that is called a home button or zoom to layer button. So whenever you pan around the map and you want to go back to the initial view, you just click on that button and it will reset the view to where it um, was in the beginning. And I arbitrarily chose five different background maps that you can toggle. One with a very light setup, which is usually preferable for most data representations. Um, then there's the same map in a very dark setup, because sometimes you might color code your um, geometries with very light colors, then you don't see them on that background. Then map you will automatically decide for you which background to take. Um, there's a standard open uh, street map and there's some world imagery, so basically satellite image that you can um, lay behind the points. And there's also an open topography map, which basically gives you the topography overview um, in a quite detailed way. You can visualize many layers on top of each other very easily. I'll show you how to do that tomorrow. And you get a scale bar and you usually, when you don't only plot the geometries, um, you get a scale, uh, a legend for the color-coded points um, by default, but we'll see that in the hands-on tutorial uh, tomorrow in more detail, okay? Um, MapView itself has, because it's a package that is intended to provide quick and easy visual access to all sorts of data um, classes that we have in R, like SF, SP, Raster, there's a package called Satellite, um, it has a lot of arguments and a lot of methods defined, so the help page isn't really very conveniently organized and very straightforwardly accessible. Um, so I put together what, in my point of view, are the most important arguments that you will use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm currently thinking of revamping the API for MapView to make it a bit easier to not have as many arguments um, available in the front end, which you can still pass to them, but more of them will be settable via options that you define globally once, and then they are <clears throat> there for the session. But the most important um, arguments in my opinion, I work quite a bit with MapView, um, are X, obviously the object that you want to visualize, because otherwise you won't see anything. Um, the Z call or Z call, which is basically the column that you choose in your attribute data frame for the color mapping <coughs> of um, your data. Then call dot regions, which refers to the fill color I chose to go with what was when we started developing MapView, SP plot was the standard plotting method for um, vector data, <clears throat> and also raster, I think, had a method for it, right? Um, and so we chose to follow their argument naming, um, which is based on lattice, as far as I can tell. Um, so call.regions basically refers to the fill color, and that is valid for points and polygons. So points are little circles which are filled with a color and have an outline. Um, and for lines, there's a color argument. And then there's an argument which has become quite popular, I guess, um, which is called burst. It's basically a logical argument where you can say, I want to visualize all six of those attribute columns at once and have them stacked as layers on top of each other that I can toggle between, okay? So you don't have to prepare six different um, objects. Map you will just do that for you by just setting burst to true. But we'll see more of that tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> then the other package why I'm here is called map edit, which as the name implies, allows you to interactively edit some of your data. Um, that was an initiative that I um, supplied to the R Consortium and they agreed to fund it and I found a very, very capable person of basically implementing all the um, functionalities. 
His name is Kenton Russell, and I, I'm highly in debt to that guy because um, he really uh, pushed map view or map edit quite a bit um, in the beginning, and he's just very good on both sides, uh, the JavaScript side and the R side, one of a, a very rare combination in the R spatial or R, especially R spatial community. Um, and map edit is basically designed to help you with quick tasks where you think you need to work on your geometries. So add a couple of vertices to polygons or move a point from A to B. Okay, the analogy I always uh, put up is if I just want to get a carton of eggs from the supermarket around the corner, then I don't need to do, uh, take my big truck. I can just as well go with my bike. It's easier, it's quicker. I don't have to find a car park and everything. Um, and that's basically what map edit is for you. But it will never be a full-blown GIS system, okay? That's just beyond the scope, and there's no point in reinventing anything that works really well in QGIS um, or uh, Grass or whatever, okay? It's for quick and easy and small things. Um, <clears throat> it is a Shiny-based application, MapEdit, so it works naturally in Shiny, for which you get modules. I'm not going to go into any detail with those uh, or over those with you tomorrow. We have applications that are based on those modules, so basically the modules are Shiny compatible or modules of Shiny. And then we provide a few Shiny apps that are accessible via the package, which is basically edit and select map, they are called. And then on top of that, we have another abstraction that works for spatial vector data, so as P objects or as F objects, um, which are then called edit features or select features, or there's even a further um, layer where we say we have a function that is called draw features. And what they do is pretty easy. I mean, you have an object that you want to edit, you type edit features of that object, and then you get um, a graphical representation and can edit the vertices or the um, points or whatever of this feature. I'll show you this tomorrow. Select features is where you just do a manual visual selection, not by subsetting by something that, um, I don't know, requires you to have a, um, <clears throat> some whatever you do in, in, in subsetting in general, when you go subset my data frame, I don't know, variable x equals a or whatever. But here you can just subset by really selecting whatever you want to select, because sometimes subsetting by comparison is just not possible, OK? Um, so I'm going to show you how that works tomorrow as well. There is one more thing that we want to implement in MapEdit, and that is um, attribute future, uh, feature editing. So whenever you click on a pop-up or you have a... We're not sure. It's a very tricky development for the um, UI, the user interface. But in the end, you get some sort of tabular representation of your attributes, and you can just quickly type in there and then save that, and then it will save will be saved in the object that you get returned from your Shiny app into your R workspace. Um, that is not yet implemented, but that will happen hopefully fairly soon, depending on uh, Kenton's time frame. And whenever you have ideas, please feel free to uh, go to the GitHub page and um, open up issues and feature requests. We are happy to try to implement whatever people want, as long as it fits into the scope. Okay? There is a few blog posts on the rspatial.org site, three of them, like an intro, a more mature one with new features that were released with MapEdit 2.0, uh, 0.2. And then just recently, I don't know if you are aware, but Leaflet had a big upgrade to the underlying uh, JavaScript library, which broke a lot of things that used to work with the old one. Um, our studio has released a new Leaflet R wrapper around that new Leaflet JavaScript library. 
and that enabled MapEdit to come up with a few uh, more possibilities, and those are described in that last blog post there. Okay, that's pretty much all I have for the two packages that I'm going to have um, the tutorials about tomorrow, but I want to quickly touch on something that I think is quite important when you represent data on a map, okay? And for that, I borrowed some slides from Hadley Wickham, which he presented, I don't know, six years ago at a USR conference where I happened to be in his um, tutorial. And he asked a couple of easy questions. Basically, three points, and which one represents the larger value? Does anybody care to answer? Or can we get a show of hands? Is it left, middle? The left side, the middle, or the right side? Okay, I guess we agree here, right? Now, if I plot those three on a map, what do you say now? It's not that easy anymore, is it? As I mentioned for, um, before that latitude and longitude pairs are only valid in pairs, and that relates to what you see here. Because our x and y are taken by the latitude and the longitude now, and we can't represent any other value of the geometry by their location on the reference system anymore because it is just taken, okay? So what could we do to compare an arbitrary value that lies behind or that is an attribute of each of those points? How could we get around the fact that it doesn't really mean anything when it comes to, let's say, these represent temperature? different temperature values, measurements of temperature at different locations, how could we compare them on a map? With color. With color? Sorry? Size of the bubble, okay. Size is a bit tricky because size might mean something in that reference system as well. Size is okay for points. But it's not that okay for polygons, because polygons are fixed in space in our reference system. Yeah? Can you just have a number by? You could just plot the number in there, yeah, yeah, that is very good. But I guess most of the time, um, and I guess you've seen lots of maps in your life, it is about color, okay? So again, the same question, which one is the larger value? Can you tell? Show us the legend is a good point, yes. And I'm quite happy that MapView now provi uh, provides legends by default because, um, yeah, I'll tell you about that tomorrow. But yeah, legends are always a good point. But then it's still tricky to say which one is larger when it comes to your perception. Which one would you perceive as larger? I mean, if I tell you I mean pink is larger, then that's fair enough. Um, but in general, you can't. Just with the hue of the color, you cannot represent any ordered values, okay? You can only represent A and B, and that they are not equal. How about now? That one on the right side, or who's for the right side? Who would think the left one? There's at least one back there, good. Okay, I think most people agree that the one on the right side is representing the larger value. And how about now? Would you still say the right one, or would you switch to Roger Bivens? Uh, suggestion that the left one is larger. I 
I hear it's tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. It is, uh, well, it depends on the context of your visualization. And that's about as philosophical, uh, philosophical as I get today. Um, it always depends on the context, okay? So, I mean, you see with these three or four little uh, slides that it's not that easy and colors are really um, critical and not really easy to deal with. There's, when it comes to mapping, generally three types of color um, palettes that you can use. Sequential, diverging, and qualitative palettes. Um, and I've put the statistical scales or the scales of your uh, data um, underneath those. So whenever you have ordinal, differential, or rational data, you can use sequential or you should use sequential. Unless you have a certain common origin, then you would go for diverging. But for nominal data, uh, data you should take um, the qualitative uh, colors. And that is something where MapView is not really good at because MapView doesn't have any qualitative um, palettes by default. MapView will by default always take one of the sequential um, palettes. I might change that in the future, but um, we'll see. So just be aware that choosing the color is um, quite important. Now, colors are represented in a so-called color space, and the most common color space that everybody knows is RGB, the color representation of the red, green, and blue channels, um, which is, and we're now talking about ordered values, so one is larger than the other is larger than the other, or is even twice as large as the other value. Um, RGB is a color space that doesn't really lend itself to represent data in such or such data um, by color coding. And that is because when we start with the same value on the left side and add 50 points to the red channel, we end up with the muddy green, and we add another 50 points, um, we end up with a muddy brown, okay? When we do the same representation in the green channel, we basically just increase the saturation of the green. So we go from a grayish to a really light or bright green. And if we do the same in the blue, we completely change from uh, green to blue. So how could we possibly say that whenever we add 50 in the blue, that represents the same change in the data as the change for the next two blue values. Okay, it's just not really um, perception-wise, it's uh, not a very good color space. There is a color space that does that much better, which is called HCL, which is the default palette for ggplot2, is based on each HCL. And there, whenever you add 50 points in the luminance, for example, you get a nice continuous representation of the change of your data, which is from, from a perception point of view, um, pretty close to what the data um, change is. You can do the same in the chroma channel, where you go from gray to saturated, whatever color it is. Um, and you can change the hue if you just want to represent uh, different values. So A doesn't equal B, okay? You use the hue. So that is a color space that is much more preferable when it comes to representing your data rather than any RGB-based um, color scales. When you transfer that to real data that people usually use, or real color palettes that people usually use on maps. I think most of us have seen the first two, especially people that work in meteorology or oceanography, will be very accustomed to maps where you represent temperature on a color scale like the first two that you see here, which is quite problematic because why should you perceive a change from yellow to green 
just as much as a change from blue to uh, violet. Why should it be similar? You don't perceive it as being similar, okay? There is <clears throat> one um, color palette that is from the color brewer um, package, or our color brewer package, which is a highly recommended package from my side as well. There's a good website um, for the color brewer color schemes, um, and that's the spectral one, which kind of mimics um, the at least temperature range where people think blue is cold and um, red is hot, but it still has the problem that it changes um, the lightness or the luminance of the data or of the um, colors quite randomly, actually. The f um, four last ones are much better. So the HCL one is just the color space that I just showed you which is a continuous change in lightness or in luminance in that way. So whenever you perceive a change along the color scale, you will perceive that change as constant, no matter where you move on the color scale. The same is true for Viridis, Inferno, and the SF colors, which are basically the SP colors, right? Used to be in the SP package as well. Um, those represent continuous data quite well. Now, MapView, MapView goes for uh, vector data with the Viridis palette, and for raster data, we take the Inferno, uh, just because it looks nicer. In the end, it's a, a little bit of a component is there where you think it's an aesthetic choice as well, which one you like better, right? When I say real-world examples, that is basically what people have seen before, right? And I think that is a really bad representation of um, data. What you see here is um, sea surface temperature um, in some random month in 2009 or something. And what I really don't like about this is that you get the impression that there is a sharp decline in or increase in temperature from here to there and from here to there. Okay, which is actually not true. It's just perceived by you because of a bad choice of a color palette. If you do that with the spectral one, it's slightly better. You see there's a lot more gradual change when it comes to this, but you still see that yellow is a bit of a problem because it highlights it too much, that there's too much of a... Um, a line in there, let's call it just a line for now, okay? Whereas if you go with the HCL one, you don't see those abrupt changes anymore, most of the time, unless where they really occur in your data, okay? When you look in your data, those are real jumps, but they are not here anymore, for example. And the same is true for all the other color palettes, so I'm just gonna flick through those. And that's basically the one that map you would use by default for raster data, okay? So I hope I have convinced Tom now as well because we had a little argument about this on Twitter the other day. Um, and that's basically all I wanna say for now. Um, if there's any questions, feel free. And we're gonna have a lot more hands on regarding map view and map edit tomorrow. Are there any questions? Well then, Robin, I guess. So, uh, this uh, color legend, this is about so people that uh, are color blind, partially or fully, no? That's one of the other um, components that they um, adhere to is color blindness, yes. Yeah. But Whereas this one, the, that one doesn't. Yeah. So, so what do you do? You organize some kind of police if somebody publishes a plot in the this <laughs> legend? No, I'm, I, I won't say I'm, a poli I'm policing you, I just mentioned that there is better ways of representing that data visually. Okay. 
So Don't take it personal. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm bit, getting a bit worried because I am starting to get messages that, you know, it's wrong, we shouldn't do it, and, and I find it a bit of a personal preference, I don't know. If, yeah, it's, it's more though than per, uh, personal preference because you're representing your data in a way that perceptually you see things that are not there. Okay. But uh, I, I have a feeling that's much more important that you release the data open. You know, it's not how, which color legend you use. I think the most important is that you, you give your data, you made it accessible, and you made it accessible through some OGC standard. And then, and that's what I'm trying to do. And then I leave it to people how they, which color legend they want to pick. You know, you can customize it then. Of course, the but button. how many people would you think redo your analysis to um, change the color palette and just accept, uh, accept it the way you publish it? So I would say you've got a... Um, responsibility to not distort your representations um, or distort your representations as little as possible. You will always distort them. When you map something to color, there's just no way around it, but you can do so in more or less. Let's say it like that. So, but we'll, we'll talk about this, okay, uh, maybe not in All public right. anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any, Any other, other questions? questions? There was a question, no? Yeah, Roger. Roger, yes. <coughs> so if you want to play with the color representations, you can either use uh, our color brewer, which gives you good opportunities, or HCL Wizard. Yes. H HCL Wizard is, is where you were. Uh, if, if you can manage to find uh, the article describing uh, hurricane track uh, aesthetics, uh, read it. I, I think it's linked from HCL Wizard. Okay. As it, 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 there's an article about representation of meteorological phenomena, which not only is bad for people with impaired uh, sight, but is bad conceptually because you've got this up and down, up and down in intensities, so that, that uh, the original article about getting away from our Jeep land was, was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we should have got away by now. We should, yeah. In my opinion, yes. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? No. Well then. <laughs>